morning. Welcome. This is our inaugural Education Now presentation at Grand Rounds. These Grand Rounds are presented by faculty members conducting research supported by the Department of Medicine Education Innovation Grants. I'm Laura Zakowski, and today I'm presenting the speakers as the chair of the Department of Medicine Education Committee and the committee that awarded these grants. Our first presenter is Dr. Christine Kolomainen, who is clinical adjunct assistant professor. Her MD is from Mich Michigan State College of Human Medicine, and she completed her residency at UW. She has an MS from UW in educational leadership and policy analysis, and she completed a fellowship in women's health at the Middleton VA. She is director of the National Coordinating Center for the VA Advanced Fellowship in Women's Health and the medical director of women's health at the VA. Dr. Kolomainen has authored a number of publications, abstracts, and conducted workshops on the topics of gender, leadership, women's health, and implicit bias. Today we will hear a presentation entitled Working in a Biosphere. Our second presenter is Dr. Tom Schiffler, who is clinical assistant professor in the Division of General Medicine. His MD is from UW, and he completed his residency at the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, where he also was the primary care chief resident. He then practiced as a hospitalist in Albuquerque before returning here. Dr. Schiffler is the medical director for the University Station Internal Medicine Clinic, and he was a recent recipient of the DOM Schilling Harkness Teaching Award for excelling in educating medical students. Dr. Schiffler has presented a number of abstracts on his research in online learning, and today he will co-present with Dr. David Feldstein. And Dr. Feldstein is an associate professor, CHS, in the Division of General Medicine. Dr. Feldstein's MD is from Stony Brook School of Medicine in New York, and he completed a residency and chief residency at University of Massachusetts Medical Center. He also is just about to complete his master's degree in educational leadership and policy analysis here at UW. Dr. Feldstein is course director for a very popular online fourth year medical student course entitled Clinical Therapeutics, Preparation for Residency. He chairs or is a member of a many important hospital, school, and national committees that address important issues of accreditation, technology, quality, and evidence-based medicine. Dr. Feldstein has authored a number of publications and abstracts and presented many workshops on evidence-based medicine. Drs. Feldstein and Schiffler will present Just Do It, Make Your Online Learning Interactive. That is our second presentation. I'll turn the podium over to Dr. Kolomainen. Thank you for that kind introduction. Today I'm going to be talking about my topic of working in a biosphere. Um, I'm going to start out by defining what I mean by implicit bias, and then talking about a little bit about how it can impact our clinical and professional work lives. I'm then going to describe two studies that we did here at the University of Wisconsin that talk about the differences in experiencing leading codes as a factor of gender, and give a brief overview of the Breaking the Bias Habit uh, workshop, a workshop that we've developed here that helps reduce implicit bias for internal medicine residents. But before I get started, I'm going to tell you a story about the first time I ever even thought about implicit bias in medicine. So it was intern year, orientation week, and I was a newly minted MD. I was in an ACLS course trying to learn about how to lead a code in case something happened when I was on the wards the next month. And we were in the part of the, um, the course where we were watching a video of somebody leading a successful code. And in the code, there was a woman leading the code, and she was directing traffic. She was telling one person to give epinephrine, and another person to start chest compressions, and another one to get on board because they were going to swap in at the two-minute mark. And so there was this flurry of activity on the screen, and she was directing it all and orchestrating it. But as we were watching it, the person I was sitting next to leaned over and whispered, wow, she's a bitch. And I wondered if we would have thought that if it was a male doing all those same behaviors. And I use this story to uh, define the difference between explicit bias and implicit bias. Because if you were to sit there and ask either the resident or myself, 
what our explicit thoughts on gender were, we would largely have no bias. We both probably think that women can be successful doctors and run a successful code. But watching that video triggered unconscious stereotypes about women in leadership. And that's when implicit bias can happen. It happens when we unintentionally use stereotypes to make decisions. And in healthcare, it's consequential because it can influence our clinical decision making by influencing clinical judgments, patient outcomes, and ultimately can lead to help perpetuating some persistent health disparities we see in medicine. An example of this is a, a clinical vignette study. So the authors of one study, they made this elegant clinical vignette of a middle-aged person who was a former smoker who presented with a chronic cough. And they asked primary care physicians to diagnose this person. And the only thing that they changed was they had half the physicians see a male patient and half the physicians see a female patient. And what happened is the male patients were most likely to be diagnosed with COPD based on just the same information. Um, and women patients were more likely to be diagnosed with asthma or a non-respiratory complaint. Now, the authors of that study didn't measure bias per se, but we know that there are assumptions and stereotypes about women manifesting anxiety or other symptoms as respiratory complaints. And there are stereotypes that women don't, aren't as likely to be smokers. And that perhaps helps explain the discrepancies in those diagnoses. Implicit bias also can impact professionally, uh, physicians professionally by constraining opportunities for full advancement of women and racial and ethnic minorities in academic medicine. It can influence career decisions, interactions with colleagues, and interactions with leadership. There was a linguistic analysis that looked at medical student performance evaluations, and they found even at that early stage, medical students were already, female medical students were already being subtly socialized towards primary care and family medicine, and males towards subspecialties. If you want to get a little bit more into this, there was a lovely review done by our own Dr. Chapman um, in Journal of General Internal Medicine, and you're welcome to read it for a full synopsis of implicit bias in healthcare. But I didn't know all that in orientation week of intern year. All I knew is I had that experience and I wanted to look into it further. And that led us to our first study of being um, afraid of being witchy with a bee, a qualitative study on how gender influences residents' experiences leading codes. For this study, we interviewed 25 internal medicine residents, both here and then nationally, and we asked them about their experiences leading codes. And we analyzed those uh, interviews and looked for emerging, emerging themes. One theme that came out is residents had consensus about what ideal leadership looked like in a code situation. They thought it was important that this, the code leader have a loud, deep voice and use clear, direct language. One male resident said, I used a commanding voice without any sort of mincing of words when he was leading a, a, a code. They also thought it was important to appear calm. One resident said, in reality, I am panicked, but I think I can mask that, and I think that's helpful. People want to see, oh, somebody's got this under control, even if you don't feel like you do. Residents also agreed that it was important to be assertive and have an authoritative presence. One resident said, I try to be the focal point in the room where you can see me and you know that I'm the one running the code because I'm the one who's talking and I'm the one who's standing at the foot of the bed telling people what to do. So men and women residents alike in our study agreed that these were ideal code leadership behaviors. But we wanted to look at these behaviors through the lens of gender. So we know that there are stereotypes about how men and women should behave that are well known and well worn in, in society. Men are typically socialized to be authoritative and dominant and decisive and a clear, direct communicator. Whereas women are typically socialized to be emotional and yielding, soft-spoken and polite. So when we look at those ideal leadership behaviors, we saw that there was significant overlap between male gender and ideal leadership behaviors, but not so much for females. And that's what our residents reported back to us too. One male said, anyone who tells you that being a white male with a deep voice who's a bit taller is not an advantage to being perceived in control would be lying, really in any situation, not just a code. Similarly, our female residents noticed that they had to make adjustments to their behavior. One woman said, I act differently during a code than my normal day-to-day -day behavior. 
The male residents do not have to alter their behavior quite as much, and they can be themselves more during a code and still command authority. When women were describing their leadership style during these codes, a lot of the women used the word bossy, and they were voicing some apprehension. One woman said, women are always afraid that they're going to come across witchy with a B. So echoing back to my uh, experience orientation week. Despite that, we found that men and women in our study were equally effective at being code leaders. One male said that specifically when he said, I can think of women that are just as assertive as any man when they're running a code. So women had figured out ways to integrate these conflicting identities. And they had described to us some strategies that they used. Some gave themselves permission to suspend social norms for the time while they were leading a code. Others found it helpful to affirm sources of legitimate power. So they would walk in a code room and say, I've got the code pager. Or they wanted to be wearing their long white coat to signify that they were a doctor or a resident. Some found it helpful to adopt a code persona. So just like Beyonce has a performance persona, uh, the resident, one resident in our study said, at the beginning of every code, I would just put my hair back and just stand there and order her around. To her, putting her hair back got her in the mindset that it's all business here and nothing was going to get in her way. Residents similarly found it helpful to adopt a code stance or a powerful posture while leading a code. And some even found it helpful to apologize after to kind of mitigate some of their apprehension they had in acting in this counter-stereotypic manner. So, in conclusion of that study, we knew that code leadership was critical and that an authoritative, assertive code leader was ideal. Women were able to achieve this just as well as men and successfully lead codes, but they made greater adjustments to their behavior to do so. And that may have caused some stress, but they identified some strategies that they used to do that. And put a pin in this, because we're going to come back to it, um, we, one of our conclusions was that there needs to be future leadership training that acknowledges both men and women are equally effective at running codes, but it needs to acknowledge that there are cult some cultural gender norms that influence uh, their experiences. Our second study took us in a little bit of a different direction, though. We were really surprised by the language that the residents used when they were talking about leading codes. They described them as a sort of trauma. Um, they talked about blood gushing and how sad and devastated they, they felt and how shocking the whole situation was. And so we wanted to look in and see if there was uh, what the incidence of postcode PTSD symptoms were for internal medicine residents who had participated in codes. And this was a mixed method study. So the first part of the study, we just reanalyzed the transcripts that we had from that first study, looking specifically for instances where the residents were talking about PTSD symptoms or described codes as trauma. We found that the residents clearly were describing some symptoms of PTSD. One resident talked about re-experiencing a code over and over. She said, it made me feel horrible. And of course, it was like the last day before I went on vacation. So the first few days of my vacation, I was perseverating on it. And then I was still ruminating about it when I got back to work. Another male in our study was talking about how he tried to avoid his feelings um, after running a, a traumatic code when he said, very deep, that's what I do, swallow it. Residents also described having some hyperarousal symptoms anytime they heard the code chimes go off overhead. One resident said, I just feel very agitated. I feel like I'm hypersensitive to any sort of stimuli, like my pulse is racing, I'm sweating, and it's hard to come down. In all, seven out of 25 of the residents that we interviewed either described codes as, as trauma or described a known symptom of PTSD. And five of those seven were women. But we wanted to couple that with some quantitative data. So we surveyed all internal medicine residents here at the University of Wisconsin, and we asked them about um, PTSD symptoms. We took a primary care PTSD screen and modified it, tweaked it to be specific to codes, and we uh, email surveyed all of the residents here. And what we found was largely uh, most of the residents didn't have any symptoms of PTSD and answered no to all four symptoms. But three of the residents did screen positive having two or more PTSD symptoms, and of those three, all were women. And while we were thinking about how this might be, because there's probably many factors that lead to the development of PTSD, we remembered a quote from our original or our first experiment where a woman said, in addition to remembering the ACLS algorithm and everything else you have to do during a code, 
you're also trying to assume this persona of being in charge. And I think that's a, probably a bit more stressful. So when we were thinking about our conclusions for this study, we acknowledged that PTSD symptoms are very low. But if, they, if there are symptoms, they're more likely to be endorsed by women. And we thought that leading in the stereotypically masculine um, style might induce some of this extra code-related stress for women. And so, like the first study, we came to the conclusion that there needs to be future leadership training on this, that affirms that both men and women can be equally effective as leaders, but women might have um, a different experience because of cultural gender norms. And serendipitously, we just came to this uh, uh, conclusion about the time that Dr. Zukowski and the Education Committee had their um, grant come, for, come through. And so uh, we are grateful for them for funding uh, this next part that I'm going to talk about, the Breaking the Bias Habit Workshop. So I work with Dr. Molly Carnes, and we, um, and she originally developed a workshop that helped reduce gender bias in the STEM, for STEM faculty. Participants and uh, departments that participated in her study found that they had significant increases in personal bias awareness, motivation, self-efficacy, and um, also self-reported action to promote gender equity. So we wanted to borrow a page from that, that workshop, and we modeled ours somewhat after that. We tailored our workshop, however, towards internal medicine. So we gleaned the uh, medical literature and looked for examples of how implicit bias was specifically found in healthcare to make it really salient to the residents and what they were experiencing. We also wanted to um, target implicit bias beyond gender because, um, as we know, health care disparities and um, these implicit bias um, difficulties can occur um, in social categories such as race, social economic status, weight, sexual orientation. So we wanted to make it more inclusive. We also wanted to speak to both decisions that residents were going to be making in their clinical and also their professional work lives. So we brought it out quite a bit. And we came up with this interactive three-hour, three-module workshop that I'm going to give you sort of a bird's eye view of right now. The first module, we talk about implicit bias as a habit of mind. And we give them examples about habits of mind and how they can interfere with perceptions and cause and um, even interfere with our intentions. So one of the first exercises we do with the residents is the tabletop exercise. So I ask the residents, and now I'm going to ask you, do the size and shape of these tabletops look identical to you? No, but with a few clicks of the mouse, I can prove that they are indeed the same. And we talk about how this is possible. In case you think it's some slide of computer, usually I bring transparencies and we overlay them and we, we really dig in with the residents to show how this is true, but how it's our perceptions that can be distorted and can cause error. We also do something called a Stroop color naming task. Um, where we ask the residents to call out the color of a text, uh, call out the color of a text. We try to make them do it quickly. And so I'm going to have you guys do it with me now, too. So in this first left box, I'm going to put in some words, and I want you to just call out the color of the word, ignore what it says, I don't care, um, ignore the contents of the word. And I'm going to go pretty fast, so call them out quick. How did that feel? Pretty easy, even for 8 a.m. in the morning before coffee. On the, left, on the right side, I'm going to do an incompatible trial, but I want you to do the same thing. Ignore the content of the word and just call out, call out the color of the text. And I'm going to go just as fast. Ready? How was that? Harder. Yeah. So this illustrates how we have a habit of mind of reading. And it's no ordinary and it's normal, um, and usually it helps us. But sometimes it can inter interfere with our intentions. And so we use several other examples to talk about how hab implicit bias functions like a habit of mind. It's a normal mental um, operation that usually serves us well, but sometimes it is subject to error and perceptual distortion, and sometimes it can fail our intentions. 
In our second module, we take implicit bias into the healthcare field and we talk about and we help the residents become bias literate because we think if you can name it, you can tame it. And so we start out with sometimes with a definition. One definition, uh, one bias concept we talk about is homophily, which is the tendency for people to associate and bond with people who are similar to themselves in socially significant ways. It's basically just your tendency to hang around with people who are most like you. Or as I like to think of it, birds of a feather flock together. <laughs> it seems innocuous, but it can have repercussions on people's professional lives. So we take it back into healthcare. Um, there's a study by Nunez and Smith, and she interviewed 25 internal medicine or African American physicians and asked them about their experiences being a minority in medicine. One of her participants shared their experience and uh, illustrated homophily in the professional setting when he said, I do not see those of us in leadership pipelines, and that is what makes a tremendous difference in terms of diversity. We don't get invited to the picnic or dinner parties, and that is where those jobs come up. So in this professional's experience, a physician's experience, homophily limited their career potential. We also use a couple of different ways to try to illustrate these bias concepts, these social um, science concepts. One way we use is a video. So I'm going to show you this video. Tell me what you notice. So you're giggling. Um, this, this video illustrates failure to differentiate, how people find it more difficult to distinguish members of another social category. So the woman in the video had difficulty determining the difference between the two white um, male construction workers. Um, and then we take it back into healthcare. Using that same study by Nunya Smith, um, there's a quote from a black internal medicine subspecialist that says, as a black physician, you keep on getting mistaken for other people. I was mistaken for the person who bought in the trays or the janitor person. And at this point in the workshop, we usually break out into small groups and residents can share their experiences. They often find some of these concepts really salient and report back to us, oh, uh, you know, female physician or residents will report back to us, I'm commonly mistaken for the nurse. Or we have um, an Asian resident who reports that he's always mistaken for the other Asian resident, even though they're like a foot apart in different in, in height. Um, so these concepts are often very salient, and the residents love to label it once they understand and um, understand and can, can put some terms to these concepts that they experience. And then the third module are, is where we give them the strategies to help, reduce, um, help them reduce the influence of implicit bias. So we have come up with a bunch of strategies and organized them into strategies that don't work, although you think that they might, and strategies that do work, um, or there's some research that shows that they would reduce implicit bias. And we go through them one by one and help and um, explain the literature behind it. And for example, striving to be colorblind seems like it should work. It seems like that would reduce your implicit bias behaviors, but actually, when you try to suppress the stereotype, it paradoxically increases your expression of implicit bias. And then we, so then we take a, a step into things that do work. And we'll talk about things like adopting a growth mindset because we know um, if people who report the mantra that people work hard to overcome the uh, influence of implicit bias um, demonstrate less bias behaviors after trying to adopt a growth mindset. So we talk about things that do work, things that don't, and we try to brainstorm how they can use them, particularly in their own um, work lives. At this point, we usually give them a little pocket card that has strategies that do and strategies that don't work that they can put in their white coat to remember long after our workshop. I printed out some extra ones at the back table, and you're welcome to pick up one on, the, on your way out and see if you can find a strategy to help reduce implicit bias yourself. So far, we've been able to pilot this. Um, the workshop was offered to second year internal medicine residents last year as a pilot. And residents were um, thought that the topic of implicit bias was important, and they were eager to change their behavior. Over half the residents who participated in our workshop felt um, prepared to immediately implement some bias-reducing strategies after participation. 
And hopefully soon, um, coming to a journal near you, you can read more about our results um, for the next steps of the workshop. And we're also doing a randomized control trial now um, here also at UW. So just in closing, um, next time you turn on the news or listen to the radio, maybe you'll notice a new trend. Oops. Implicit bias is the shorthand that we take for the automatic association between people and stereotypes that we have about those people. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. Implicit bias. 2016 was the year that implicit bias went somewhat mainstream. And now you know a little bit about implicit bias in healthcare. So, um, thank you to my clinical and professional and uh, co-authors and research teams, and we'll save questions for the end. So the question is, the work with codes and incorporating that into new uh, orientation for uh, house staff. So the ACLS curriculum has been changing now to acknowledge that some of these leadership behaviors might be a little bit more contrary to your normal um, tendencies. And so there's been a little bit of a nod in that direction. And I think um, Dr. Holland and some of the other interprofessional teams are working to help people com um, function more comfortably in teams when they're doing um, code trials. So there's more attention being paid, although I'm not sure that they're specifically addressing gender. Definitely was not Christine's because that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Remember how difficult it was to pay attention. How challenging it was to actually take something and learn something from that. Now imagine you're watching that lecture on your computer at home, sitting on your couch. How long before you pick up that journal next to you and start flipping through it? Let's face it, it's pretty tempting to put the TV on in the background. <clears throat> and by the time we get to the objective slide, it's time to update your social media accounts. <laughs> well, these are some of the challenges that we find when we try to teach online. There are four things that Dave and I hope that you'll take with you today from our talk. <clears throat> Number one, be able to describe the contrasting views of current online education. Number two, identify online education benefits and challenges. Three, I'm going to talk about two strategies that we've used to try to increase interaction in our online teaching. And then four, compare the impact on learners of active versus passive online learning. Now, I kind of want to make sure we're all on the same page here. When I talk about a standard classroom or traditional classroom, I think you all know what I mean. Something not really dissimilar from this. Someone's up front, there's an audience, people are, are trying to learn. When I talk about online learning, I was trying to think about how I can make sure you know what I'm talking about or have an idea, and I came up with this. And I'm looking right at Rick because I'm sure he's about to smile in a second here. That our HIPAA training, right? This is something that we have to do online and it's, it's one form of online education. So when I refer to online education, you can think of something like our HIPAA training. And I promise Rick did not ask me to put that in. <clears throat> so I mentioned that I wanted to talk about some of the contrasting views of online education. So I'm going to share with you a few results from a survey that was published in 2014. 
And in this survey, they asked academic leaders of higher education what their views were of online learning. And I picture Dean Wormer here from Animal House. So when they ask if online learning is the same or superior to classroom learning, 74% of them said yes. They had a very favorable view of it. When asked if it was critical to their long-term strategy, 71% said yes. So really seen as the future. Now in this survey, they also asked about faculty views. <clears throat> and this is Professor Snape, for those of you not familiar with the Harry Potter uh, series. And they asked faculty, do you accept the, quote, value and legitimacy of online education? Only 28% 20 said yes. <clears throat> so I thought that was quite a contrast. Now that's significant because over 5 million students took an online course in 2014. <clears throat> Another thing that I wanted to talk about were benefits of online education that I wanted to, to tell you about. So these are some of the published benefits out there. It allows a, a variety of programs and courses to be offered, a more comfortable learning environment. How comfortable is that? But if it's family movie night, don't do your HIPAA training during family movie night. That'll just get you into trouble. <laughs> Convenience and flexibility. It allows you to avoid a commute, something very practical. Allows for career advancement. Picture someone who has a part-time or full-time job or family responsibilities. They can't necessarily be in a classroom at you know, 8.30 on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And then lower total costs, so less overhead wanted to include, too, some of the observations that Dave and I have had about benefits to online medical education. So this is more through our clinical therapeutics course that Laura mentioned. It allows us to disseminate a standardized curriculum, both geographically and temporally. Now that's nice because it allows our medical students to do things like be away for residency interviews, do visiting rotations, international electives, and second looks, and things that may be difficult to coordinate earning credits for. If they're doing our course or something similar to it, they can still be earning credits towards graduation. Challenges. Well, I'm going to talk about one of the major challenges that I sort of alluded to in my POW statement, and that is mind wandering. This is actually studied, and this is an interesting study. Uh, University of British Columbia had, uh, had this was done there. And what they did is they took 60 undergraduate students, they asked them to watch a 60-minute video, and then they basically asked them at points during that video if their mind was wandering or if they were focused on the speaker. And they asked them during the first 30 minutes and during the second 30 minutes. Overall, 43% of the time, students said their mind was wandering. And when they asked them in the first 30 minutes, 35% of the time their mind was wandering. And in the second half, over half the time, 52% their mind was wandering. And that was a significant difference. Now I'm looking, I don't see anyone's jaw dropping because basically what I've said is the longer we try to pay attention to the video, the more difficult it is, which absolutely. But they did something very clever too where they asked if it mattered. They wanted to know, does this actually affect performance? So they had them take a test. And when they asked questions about the first half, the first 30 minutes, 71% of the time they got that answer correct. And the second half, with uh, questions pertaining to the second half, 57% of the time they got the answer correct. And that also was a significant difference. So again, no one's too, too surprised, right? The more difficult it is to pay attention, or the less you're paying attention, the more poorly you're going to do on a test. And so I wanted to try to combat mind wandering my own talk today by introducing some interaction. So I wasn't brave enough to use poll everywhere like, like Jeremy did for his talk, but I just want to do an old school show of hands here. So what do you guys think is the optimal length for an online video? Raise your hand if you think A, nobody knows. Good. B, less than 10 minutes. All right, good. C, 11 to 20 minutes. Great, excellent. D, 21 to 30 minutes. <coughs> All right, 
And is anyone holding out for E greater than 30 minutes? <laughs> okay, good, because nobody's mind is wandering. So I actually think it's less than 10 minutes. That uh, surprised me. Now, I'll show you why I think less than 10 minutes is sort of the ideal length. These are some preliminary data published by uh, Philip Guao at the University of Rochester. And what they did is they looked at online video segments. So on the x-axis, you see from 0 to 3, from 3 to 6 minutes, 6 to 9, 9 to 12, 12 to 15, and 15 to 40 minutes. Now, on the y-axis is the amount of time that students spent watching those videos. Some of you are probably already looking ahead to see what happened as we got to the, the long, greater length videos, but look at this. If I had a video that was between six and nine minutes, the median time spent watching it, and it's median, so uh, was between six and seven minutes. So students were watching most of, if not all of that video. And when you look at the shorter videos, probably pretty similar. Between three and six, they were watching four to five minutes. Between zero to three, over a minute. Once you got later on and longer videos, they watched actually less than they did of the six to nine minute video. So if I had a 9-12 minute video, they were watching about 6 minutes of it. A 12 to 15 minute video, they were watching between 2 and 5 minutes. Then a 15 to 40 minute video, like 4 minutes. That surprised me. So, how do we use this? Well, you've heard of our course, Clinical Therapeutics. And I just want to say, um, Dave and I run this course, but we have a tremendous amount of help. Not just from Yuyen Cheng, who's our course administrator but many of you. And this course really relies on the faculty who have stepped up, given generously of your time. So thank you to those of you who help us with this. It's entirely online. It's an elective that's available to senior year medical students. It runs December through March. And if you wonder why we do that, well, that's because that's when it coincides with residency interview season. We have, this is what I was talking about, over 70 topics by over 50 faculty members, so thank you so much. It's mostly asynchronous. What I mean by that is I call it a pajama course, meaning it can be 2 a.m., you can be sitting in your apartment and working on clinical, clinical therapeutics, earning credits towards graduation. It's well attended. We have 129 students who signed up for it this year, which is just awesome. And ways that we've tried to increase interactivity within our course, I'm going to talk about two of them, case scenarios and web conferences. So I'm going to talk about case scenarios first. Now, these are a learning opportunity developed using a program called CSCR, or Case Scenario Critical Reader. And that was developed here at University of Wisconsin. Basically, it allows for different media to be incorporated into a learning topic, and how we use it largely is you can easily incorporate quizzes and the students get feedback during that. What I'm showing you here is the case scenario that Dr. Kristen Knackers from the Department of Pediatrics has put together for our course. So usually what we would have before this is a video. So she has a recorded video where she presents some information to the students. Then the students get to a slide that looks like this. It looks pretty similar to like a board's type question, right? You have basically a patient who's coming in to see you. One cool thing I want to point out that she's done is she has an audio clip of wheezing. So this is a kid with an asthma exacerbation. So the students can actually, you know, reinforce what that sounds like. And then they have to pick an answer in terms of the treatment. So if we pick the bronchodilator, we get feedback that that is the correct answer. And we can continue. If students pick the incorrect answer, they have to pick again. And they aren't allowed, they aren't able to move forward in the case scenario until they get the correct answer. So it's a way for faculty to really drive home uh, an important point. The other way we do it is web conferences. So this is uh, some screenshots that I took from Dr. Mark Mysek from the Division of General Internal Medicine. So briefly, this is probably about what you guys would expect. Uh, the students have already viewed his lecture. In this case, it was on enteric infections. This is the one part of our course that is synchronous, meaning we didn't give them Mark's home number. They actually have to, you know, log in at, say, 5.30 on a Tuesday night or whenever we have it set up. And then Mark will present them with a case. We break out into rooms. What I mean by that is that four or five students uh, are, are broken into groups, and they go through questions and come up with answers. And then we come back as a big group and talk about 
what everyone thought were the answers and, and try to include some interaction that way. And finally, I just want to share with you some of our evaluations because it's one thing to just sort of do this, but do our students like it? Doesn't matter. And the first thing I want to share with you is the question, uh, case scenarios were a valuable learning experience. So we wondered this because it is a little bit different than what they're used to, right? It's, and we wondered if they viewed this as something that was valuable to them. And you can see overwhelmingly, over 99%, 119 out of the 120 students who replied to this last year said, yes, they felt the case scenarios were valuable. Okay. But this I thought was really interesting. We asked them if they preferred them to the, basically the traditional lecture, uh, the recorded lecture that they were viewing. And again, overwhelmingly they preferred them. So even though it may take a little bit more effort, a little bit more attention on their part, they really like that interactive component. 111 out of 119 students who had responded, 93%, said they preferred the case scenario. So what we took effect from that is that students really want more interaction. This is not a mistake. I actually put this up here twice because I thought some of your minds might be wandering. <laughs> so if you take one, one more thing from me, I want you to remember that students really preferred that interactive online learning opportunity. And then I can't can't pass this off today without reading a few quotes from our students. More interactive cases and web conferences would be beneficial since these two educational tools provide feedback in real time. You should make all the lectures into case scenarios. It's more effective. I remember more of what I learned in the case scenarios than the lectures that I struggled to pay attention to. Many of the lectures were over an hour. Not that many. It's, it's, it's fair. It's fair. There are some. And nobody's attention span is that long. It also forces you to apply information as you go, which is more effective than passive listening to people talk at you. Okay, so they like interaction, but the question is, does it actually help? And for that, I'm going to turn it over to Dave. Thank you, Tom. So uh, I feel like a little bit like a relief pitcher here, so Tom set it all up for me, and I'll, I'll try. I think I'm supposed to throw strikes and not let people on base, so I'll, I'll try and work on that. So does interaction help? So the students really like it. Uh, it seems like it should help. But we know that it takes faculty more time to do the interaction. So we don't want to go switch our 70 topics over to interactive and spend all our faculty time if it's not going to help. So that led to our current trial that we're going to talk about. So we did a randomized control trial within this course. And our objectives here were to determine uh, if interactive online learning improves student knowledge, retention, and self-efficacy, and then to determine the time required. So remember, there were the two issues there. Uh, we, we thought that it might work, but how much time was this going to take? So here is our study. You can see we start our students enroll. Am I getting a little bit of feedback? Our students enroll in clinical therapeutics. The course, as Tom mentioned, begins in uh, December. Uh, and then, uh, so then our students were randomized, and we did, uh, we stratified uh, our students by the uh, residency program that they were planning on going into, and we blocked it so that we would get equal groups. Uh, if I'm teaching you about EBM, we'll talk about that later. Uh, you can see 121 out of our 123 students agreed to participate, so that was great. They either went into the control group or the intervention group. And we used five different topics to look at this. So we used depression, hypertension, uh, vasopressor therapy, skin infections, I should say soft tissue infections, and uh, sexually transmitted infections. Uh, we wound up a little heavy on the ID. I'm not sure why that was. <laughs> so they would view these five topics either as a recorded lecture or interactive through the CSCR. And I'll describe the differences a little more in a then after they completed that topic, they would take a quiz immediately after, and we'll call that the immediate post quiz, as well as a self-efficacy. So to get an idea if they felt more comfortable caring for that condition. Then two weeks later, we emailed them the same quiz. They hadn't received any, uh, uh, any um, answers, so they still supposedly, if they knew it, they knew it. If they didn't, they didn't. And they completed the same quiz a second time. So we could see not only how they did immediately after, but how they did two weeks later. 
And then the course ended in uh, March. So we did this last year during our course. As I said, I want to mention a little bit more about the intervention and control groups. So the intervention group used the CSCR. We used short lecture components. We shot for five to 10 minutes. Uh, we did pretty well there. And the reason why we shot for five to 10 minutes is based on the, the data that Tom presented earlier. And then students, as Tom mentioned, got immediate feedback on these cases. Oh, here's an example. So as Tom showed, this is our uh, Pointer, sorry about that. Uh, so this is Tom and his recorded lecture. If you look over on the right-hand side there, you'll see Tom didn't quite make it under the 10 minutes. It's 12.18. Uh, we'll, we'll let him slide on this one, but next time I'm really going to clamp down. So they, they watch this 12-minute lecture, and then they came to a case. I'm not even going to get into the exuberant Packers fan, but... And there's a lot of backstory about that one. So, so now they see this case. They have to answer questions. So they have to interact. So they go 12 minutes, but typically 5 to 10 minutes, and then they have to interact. But what did we do in the control group? The control group watched the exact same recorded lecture. And how do we know that? Because our faculty only recorded once. We chunked it up to, for the CSCR, but otherwise it ran as a straight lecture. They even had the same cases. But in this case, rather than having to do the cases interactively, the cases were uh, presented by the faculty. So actually, this slide shows us where Tom is presenting his, uh, his case and asking the questions. We told the students, and it's hard to see in yellow there at the bottom, we told the students in the control group to stop the recording and think about these questions and then continue the recording. Uh, I won't get into how often that actually happens. So the idea was that really the only difference between these two was the interaction. They were getting the exact same content by the exact same person in the exact same way. What outcomes did we look at? Well, we talked about that immediate post quiz. So that was our primary outcome. And we were looking at the mean of those five immediate quizzes. These were knowledge-based quizzes developed by the faculty who uh, did the topic. Five questions, multiple choice. And what we did is we had another faculty in the same field review uh, that to make sure that the content was OK uh, for face validity. And then we also did usability testing. So typically, two to three residents would take the quiz, and they would uh, comment on the, how difficult the quiz was, but also whether they, uh, they had any issues with any of the wording. And we made changes to the quizzes based on that. What were our secondary outcomes? So we had those two-week post quiz. That was our secondary outcome, as well as the self-efficacy scores. What do we mean by self-efficacy? We asked the question, I am confident in my ability to treat a patient with blank, depending on what the topic was. In this case, it would be treat a patient with hypertension for Tom's topic. And they could rate that on a score of 1 to 10 based on their confidence. We performed multivariable regression with covariates of the student planned residency, their age, gender, and their time to complete the topic. And these are the results. So when you look at our primary outcome of the immediate uh, post-quiz score, so remember it was on a score of 0 to 5 because there are five questions in each quiz, the difference between the experimental control group was 0.1. So the experimental group scored 0.1 higher, again, on average, than the control group. This was not statistically significant. But when you look at that two-week post-quiz, so the idea of immediate knowledge versus retention, uh, there was a difference. There was a statistical difference and a little bit bigger uh, difference as well. So a 0.3 difference. So a small but real difference here. And you can see based on the p-value, that's very unlikely to happen uh, by chance. <laughs> Self-efficacy, interestingly, really no change at all. Remember, this was immediate post. Uh, the difference of 0.1, but that's on a scale of 1 to 10. So that's even really a much smaller change and not even close to statistically significant. But one thing that we noticed, uh, Tom showed that slide about how, how much time of the video you watch trails off. Uh, I have to say we didn't have that data <laughs> about how much it trailed off. 
so what happened, which we were a little surprised, is a fair number of the students didn't complete the entire video, so they weren't receiving the entire intervention. So just as in a, uh, in a drug study, you might look at, well, what happened to the patients who actually took the drug, you know, 80% of the drug, and we'll call that the per protocol. So we did the same thing. We looked at, well, these results are nice. What happens if we look at the students that actually completed the whole intervention? And here you can see, which is what we were hoping to see, uh, is you know, sometimes it comes back from the statistician and you're happy, sometimes it comes back and you're sad. In this case, we're happy because we thought part of what was limiting the, 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 the size of the difference uh, was that students didn't complete the intervention. And this seems to bear it out. Uh, here, when you look at the two-week quiz mean score, the difference now is about 0.5, uh, still very statistically significant. So, uh, and, and you have to keep in mind this is post hoc analysis, so that's why we'll only talk about that one outcome. So, it seems to work in helping with retention. Not a big difference, but some difference. What about that faculty time? Is it going to be worth it? So, remember there are five faculty. These are all five faculty. We asked faculty on a weekly basis as they were developing these, how much extra time did it take to do the interaction? So they were doing the lectures along with the interaction. You can see that it took anywhere between two and 12 hours, uh, although there was only one faculty member up there at, at 12 hours. So this seemed like it was feasible, still extra time, but at least in the feasible range. We know that in some of these more complicated interactive scenarios, it can take, um, I see Shobi smiling, it can take literally hundreds of hours to develop these. So we were going with kind of a minimalistic approach. What is the minimal amount of interaction and how much time faculty time will take? We were worried that it would take the students a lot more time. That actually didn't bear out at all. So when you look at this, there was no statistically significant difference in student time across any of the five topics. Uh, and in fact, when you look at topic four and five, uh, over to the right, there actually took longer for the control group to complete, now only by a minute or so, uh, than it did for the intervention group that's in blue. So the idea here that, that it would take students longer actually didn't bear out at all. It seems that it takes students about the same amount of time. So what can we glean from this? So we saw that there's no significant change in immediate quiz score. There are lots of reasons why that could have happened, uh, but certainly nothing we can claim at this point. But it does seem to have a much bigger effect on retention, so when we look at the two week later. And probably some of the reason why we saw a smaller impact, uh, again our post hoc analysis shows, is that students didn't receive the full intervention. If they weren't watching the full the full videos and doing the, the full intervention, then there's not much we could do to, uh, to improve their learning. The uh, poor rates of completion, as I said, may have uh, led to that problem. So overall, what do we take away from this online and interactive learning? So the role of online learning keeps increasing. Uh, Tom mentioned how, uh, you know, pretty much across academic leaders. They feel that this is important. It's the wave of the future. If you look at what we've done with our curriculum transformation here, we've put a lot more emphasis on online learning. It does have many benefits, including being able to do it in your pajamas. I always think of that as a benefit. I just did a web conference the other day in my pajamas. It's, uh, it's kind of freeing. Uh, but the, uh, what do we have to keep in mind? So we need to use small chunks. Uh, the evidence shows us that we really should be somewhere in that five to ten minute range as we discussed. It does seem to prevent, uh, sorry, to promote retention and students like it. It's always good when students like it and they do better. Sometimes you have that problem where it's one or the other. And this big issue of the interactivity requires more faculty time. In this case where we're talking about kind of that minimal interactive, we just intersperse these cases, it's not a lot more faculty time. So it is something that's feasible. Now something we didn't look at is, well, what if we put in that more interactivity? What if we made it much more interactive where basically the whole thing is interactive, we're not having these videos, and we do have a couple of CSCRs like that within our course, uh, 
but the, as I mentioned, the amount of time to, to develop those is incredibly uh, time intense, and so we didn't feel that's something you can do for an entire course. So, to acknowledge the people who made this possible, uh, Tom already mentioned Yuyan, without whom we wouldn't be able to run this course at all, and uh, certainly uh, a special thanks to the Department of Medicine uh, Education Committee. Uh, the grant came along at a great time when we were just thinking about this ourselves, and it gave us an opportunity to, to actually study it. So, at this point, I think Tom and I would be happy to take any questions. So the question was about uh, true video, so a recorded video versus basically a PowerPoint slide where you could click through and, and go through quickly. Um, with the, the study that I, that I showed, it's preliminary data. And so actually the details about what was in those, those zero to three and, and three to six and so on, videos is not yet published. Um, so, and I, I'm, I'm also not sure how many students were included and what the subject was. So. Uh, so I don't know about that. Uh, it did <clears throat> trigger a thought with our course. One of the benefits of the case scenarios is that you really can't just click through, because even if you try to do that, you're going to be blocked by a video or pretty quickly a question where you have to answer it correctly. But in your standard previous approach, was it two videos of the... Yeah. about students watching it at, at faster speeds, uh, and does that affect our, our data, and how, how would that, um, how might that impact what they get out of it? So, uh, so that's an interesting question, and we've noticed that as well. In fact, one year we, we didn't give them the ability to watch it faster, and we got so many complaints from <laughs> students. Uh, so, so absolutely, that is an issue, and we actually have that data in terms of what speed they were watching it at. Uh, we recorded that. We 
haven't looked at that yet. That's another area we were interested in, it, to really see how fast are they watching it. And so we can ultimately look at, put that into our uh, regression model and see whether the speed that they were watching at. It's a little bit difficult because what happens is they often switch around speeds. But that is something that we're planning on looking at. So that's a great question. We should stop there. And I want to thank both groups for presenting their data today. And the rest of the morning, we have Department of Medicine Education Day. Many of you have signed up to participate. But if you haven't and you would like to come over to the Centennial Building in 1220, we're beginning a little bit of a discussion, then have some breakout sessions and then follow that with lunch and also a presentation and update of what's happening at the medical school transformation. So thank you for excellent speakers today and for all of your good questions.